find it really ironic talking about roses today. Even though I'm passionate about growing plants, it's the one plant I swore I'd have nothing to do with. I have a, a passion about growing roses and plants, and I had that since I was born, essentially. I was a little guy that grew the tomato plants and had the vegetable gardens. I knew I was going to be a, a gardener. And I took that and I got a master's degree in horticulture. I started a business, started growing plants, landscape plants, for uh, the Houston, San Antonio, Austin economies, and did so with vigor right out of school. Uh, grew a lot of privet, botinias, Asiatic jasmine, common exotic landscape plants. And I did. I thought a very good job of it. I rooted them and they sold immediately. The seedlings that I grew, cuttings I grew. I went home to my wife and I said, we're gonna be rich, this is so easy. <laughs> and as you know, life throws you a curve. Uh, the economy went south and I had to do something different. Uh, I was having to compete with much larger nurseries that had a whole lot more staying power than my small little company. So I went out into the back roads of Texas hunting for native plants that I could offer as alternatives to these overused privets that I was growing. And I became involved with a group of people that did this, and it was very, very enjoyable. I uh, found all kinds of penstemons and salvias and wonderful companions for, uh, you know, to, as alternatives. But what was really interesting is I found roses these plants that I associated being fussy, hard to grow, having to spray all the time, not something I wanted to grow, as you know. So when I found these roses growing in cemeteries or abandoned home sites, you know, places where they were not getting care from human hands, it was a change in my thinking. It was kind of like, you know, shopping for a Toyota you're determined to buy one, but you want to research it a little bit. As you go home, you know, you see all the Toyotas on the road. It was the same way with roses. I found them everywhere. This was completely, you know, opposite of what I would think about roses. I thought they were so fussy that they had to be cultivated in order to survive. These were time-tested survivors. And cemeteries proved to be very fruitful hunting grounds for finding these time-honored plants of, of, of the past. People in honoring the deceased would often plant their favorite rose or plant, it could be an iris or something else, by the headstone. And I was finding headstones that dated over 100 years, and this just blew me away. I love what uh, people have come up with the, the idea about cemeteries. You know, if dead people can grow them, then anybody can. <laughs> but there's a message in that. You know, it's kind of like you're privy to the best. It's not like if you walk around a cemetery, you're going to find the, the weaklings. They, they've long since died or gone. You're only going to be finding the plants that have been able to withstand the blue northers, uh, you know, the, the droughts. It's kind of like Mother Nature has done her selection for you. You're finding the best of the best. So we slipped a few cuttings from these plants, and there is an etiquette about that. Certainly no pillaging of roses in, in the cemeteries. We want to make sure that those plants survive into the future for as long as they've lived in the past. So we're very careful about that. But we took cuttings, and we took them back to the nursery, and they flourished. So I was changing my mind. It was an epiphany. Uh, I had started looking at roses completely different. Uh, especially when you find these time-tested survivors. So what could they offer? Um, it went further than that. Uh, some of the greatest joy I had in doing this research, or this rustling of roses, if you will, was meeting these self-taught gardeners who garden the way of the past, the way their grandparents or their parents grew plants, passing these tendencies down. This garden, not far from here, shows the African influence. This lady, Maddie Breedlove, has the culture of her heritage of sweeping the earth from her African uh, heritage, which is what they would do there to keep the grass from growing that would harbor rats or snakes or even the fire hazards. So this was uh, something that I became just uh, 
uh, enthralled with. Talking to these people was uh, magical. They would talk about uh, plants of the past. In fact, I learned one of the ladies that I talked to, I w walked up to her door and knocked on the door and asked her what this rose was blooming. You'd think I'd get the shut door treatment, you know, because a big man like me coming to somebody's house. But it's talk of conversation about plants in the yard that certainly bring them out. And lo and behold, an hour later, I'm found in her backyard where all the treasures are found. It's that kind of generosity that, that gardeners have. But she told me that she had a red rose in her yard, and it was blooming, and I was so interested in it. And I saw this rose in an old catalog from Peter Beals in England, and I looked at it, and I saw that it was the same rose as Louis Philippe, a rose shared to Lorenzo de Zavalle when he was a minister to France when Texas was a republic in the 1840s. So this is the way these roses disseminated, and this thread of history opened up my eyes to these roses even more as to being really uh, time-tested survivors and worth bringing forward. Uh, they were lost in commerce. They weren't being offered anymore. So my charge was out to try to bring these roses back. I talked to the banks who, uh, who you know, uh, they were calling my notes because I couldn't sell the, the previous plants. And I uh, told them that I can't pay you back anyway, and you're going to have to go with me on this idea of, of selling old roses. And so that's what I did. It was a fabulous and, and interesting uh, change in my life. So the two things that I want you to take away from, from what these roses taught me was number one was fragrance. You know, fragrance is, is the soul of the plant. It's the memory. It's the emotion. I remember when we first put our garden in, we planted a little rose called Cecil Bruner, the sweetheart rose, introduced back in the 1880s. And this elderly lady came up to it and she smelled it and she turned around to me with tears welling up in her eyes. She said, I haven't smelt that since I was at my grandmother's house. She had this rose. That's the power of fragrance. And it's a very important one. It's crazy for our modern roses not to have fragrance. You hold them up, you smell them, you might as well be looking at a pretty picture in a book of a rose. It does, nothing ties you to the plant itself. But fragrance is so important. I think it, it's so important that it even makes you lose your common sense. Uh, I can say that because we have a fragrance gallery. Every year we show these roses, uh, pick them and let people walk along and smell them and we have them named there. Ever so often somebody will stammer and look at a particular rose and they'll, they'll uh, smell it and they'll stop in their tracks and they'll scurry to try to get a pen and a piece of paper out of their pocket and write down the name, rush over to the garden, try to find this rose. And lo and behold, other people have done that as well and there's only one left that's been trampled and they'll still buy it. Fragrance, like when hunters go out and hunt for bucks, they know that the fragrance of the season makes the, the, the deer lose their, their common sense. It's that kind of power. The roses, I learned, have so many fragrances. They smell like black pepper, or banana cream pie, or citrus, or damask, or true perfume. The list is endless, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing, and it's so important. And it was a poet that said, you must garden for the nose, for the eyes will take care of themselves. And I think it's so true. It's crazy for us not to have the fragrance in, in part, of the, uh, part of the garden. So that's one thing that I learned from these old roses. Old roses have fragrance, whereas many of the modern roses didn't. And they completely make you want to embrace these roses in a whole different way. The other characteristics is, is a diversity of form. All these roses are different. They're very diverse. They're not the same old cookie cutter vase-shaped roses that we put in our rectangular prisons that we call rose gardens. Uh, they're very, very different. If you put them in a rose garden, you'd be perplexed by the array of shapes and sizes. They don't work because of their varying shapes. Some of them ramble, some of them climb, some of them are small. They're all different, but therein lies their beauty. They make you, the garden artist out there, uh, capable of using individual brush strokes for your garden masterpiece, each one of them different. And this in, is, is the enthralling part about the diversity. It makes them all individuals, all with different types of personality. In fact, I, I in fact wrote a book uh, depicting the fact that some of these roses are like, like tenacious tomboys, or they're like dreamy romantics, 
Are there like stay-at-home moms where you can plant them and do other things because they're there for the long haul to be beautiful and, and gorgeous? They have personality. They're like empresses. They have the moxie to, to dominate your landscape and to be beautiful. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have that diversity and that fragrance. So I, I went from not liking roses to all of a sudden having the ultimate garden plant in roses, fragrance, diversity of form, being able to use in so many different ways in the landscape. So this was the new charge for me. I became an advocate for, for roses, and uh, it, it's, been, it's been wonderful ever since. This is a, an idea of some of the changes and some of the opportunities that you get with these roses in terms of their diversity of form and shape. This is a, 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 a picture of some of the flowers. They're not like traditional looking roses. Some of them are blousey and single and all this different form and shape. I love what one, one particular uh, person had come up with. It was Felder Rushing. It was an extension agent in Mississippi. And he was talking to a group just like today. And he said he had his daughter, Zoe, go out in the backyard. He, he told the crowd that, Zoe, I want you to go out in the backyard and I want you to stand by this rose and I'm going to take your picture. And he was just talking to the crowd. And he said, I went and got his camera. His camera didn't have any film in it. This was the day cameras had film. And he went in the backyard and pretended to take hundreds and hundreds of pictures of her, or dozens and dozens, if you will. And he says, no, I didn't get a good one. Here, stand over here, smell it from this angle. And he kept taking pictures. And he says, you know what I'm doing? He says, you know, 30 or 40 years from now, I'll probably be dead or gone. She's going to be in somebody's yard. She's going to go and smell this rose, and we'll be back together again. And I think that that's the thread that gardening should carry. I love going to my nursery now and walking around and seeing people walk amongst the, the gardens. And they're not talking about individual roses to plant or the minutia of a typical life. They're talking about reunions. They're talking about family. They're talking about much bigger things. And I think that that's a, a wonderful thing that the garden gives. And that's what I learned from finding that first old garden rose. Thank you very much.